These guys are going to ask you some questions. They, they came with a couple prepared, but we, we can sure deviate from the script. Is this a project of some kind that you yes. do with sure. World War II project or something? So far back, I'm surprised that they have anything in schools anymore. I'm glad to hear they're doing it. I am too. Mm -hmm. It's good to carry it on. Yep. Well, my name's Cecil Fuquay, and I was born in Coates. And raised in Coates, except for many years that I was gone, really. I uh, uh, left, when I left Coates in high school, I uh, went to Wake Forest. And uh, I got two years at Wake Forest before I had to, went to the service. But uh, I got a diploma from North Carolina State University in, in uh, engineering drawing after two years at Wake Forest. Then went to the service. And uh, after my service stint, I came back, got a Bachelor of Science degree at Wake Forest. And then uh, taught school for a year. I was talked into it, sort of, I knew the principal very well. Uh, did, didn't think I cared for it too much. And I went to the coast and uh, worked on boats and lived on a boat for a year and a half. Worked on boats, fishing boats, going in, out to the Atlantic for about five years. And uh, fell on the boat and fell out of work with. Uh, <clears throat> it was a 42 foot boat, party boat. Uh, he got married, moved southward. In uh, the meantime, I met this girl down there who I finally married. And she only lived four miles from me. I didn't know it at the time. So I came home and just stayed. Went back and renewed a certificate and started teaching again. That's when I taught Joe and some of the rest of them. Harold Dix, Dennis Dicote, I taught him. And, and I think at one time I something like five or six professionals in one of my high school classes. Mm -hmm. I taught uh, PE, health and PE, and um, natural science, and uh, chemistry. And, uh, and then went to the service and that was about it until uh, I got back from the service. Mm -hmm. When did you, when did, how old were you when you went into the service? 19. Mm -hmm. I took one of your questions, didn't I? <laughs> you guys might want to tell them about what your project's about, what you're studying in, in school, and uh, what, what you have to accomplish with this project, and then you can ask them your questions. I had to wait far as, by the way, at 16. When I was 16. You're 16? 16. 16? When I, that's the reason I could get all these years. Was that, was, was that when it was uh, at Wake Forest? Wake Forest? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you got any questions, I I don't know what you want, but <laughs> tell them what your project's about, what you're supposed, to, what, you, what you need to accomplish. We need to we just need to ask you some questions about the war, how like life was and stuff. Well, be glad to answer the best I can. Right. I'm pretty rusty right now. It's been a long time on dates and stuff, so. What are your feelings about World War II? Do you think it was good that America was in it or not? Well, we had no choice, really, when you think about it. I mean, uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked, and you don't just sit back and say, well, you know, next time. But, uh, that was a pretty big item. And uh, as a matter of fact, after that, Germany declared war on it. So uh, we really had no choice. Exactly? But I mean, I'm, I'm certainly in agreement with the fact that we win. Yeah. Where exactly did you go? Where did you serve? Well, when I was overseas or here or... Both. I mean, you know, I took a lot of training in the States. I um, went, entered Fort Bragg and went down to uh, Keesley Field, Mississippi. And, uh, 
took basic training down there. And then uh, left there and went to uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Army sent me and I got a, a semester course in uh, uh, aeronautical engineering. And then uh, went back to, uh, went to California, got some pre-flight, thought I was gonna be a pilot at one time. And, but I uh, left there and went to uh, Florida Gunnery School. They had so many pilots, they asked some of us to get out, go to something else. And I wanted to fly, so uh, I decided that I'd go into gunnery school. They needed some gunners. And uh, in Florida, and then finished that and went to Denver, Colorado uh, to armament. They sent me to an armament school class to teach me about bombs. So uh, I was an armored gunner on a medium bomber. And that was the extent here in. Of course, that's a pretty short version. You know, went to uh, uh, Louisiana, Barksdale Field, and got to shoot a plane and all that kind of stuff. But overseas, um, well, let, let me just give you, a, uh, when we uh, got ready to go overseas, the uh, I met my crew down in uh, Barksdale Field, Louisiana. And uh, we went up to South Carolina and were issued a, a B-26, medium bomber. And uh, they were going to fly the thing across. So uh, the navigator, they didn't need me as a gunner. And they didn't need the navigator because they uh, had to have an old experienced navigator to show them the way. So he and I flew to New York, or took a train in New York, really, and flew from there to Bermuda on the C-54, and from Bermuda to uh, the Azor Islands and Wales and on into London. And the other, the rest of the crew flew the plane we were issued into England, making, well, the northern route, North Africa and on down, and finally wound up in England, too. Um, now, we stayed in a place called Stone, England uh, for a week, week and a half, just waiting. And uh, then uh, somebody flew our plane over, I don't know, uh, some experienced crew to a place in France. And they took us, the crew, and another crew, two of them, and flew us from uh, the coast of England into a <clears throat> place called Beauvais, France. <clears throat> uh, well, Beauvais was a town, but it was right outside Beauvais. Um, and that's where we, we landed, put us off on a real dark night on a C-50, a C-46. And, um, they landed, put us out, two crews, 12 men, and took off again. And it was pitch dark. We didn't have any idea where we were. And we were on a paved road, runway or something. So we just started following it. Talking and laughing and smoking and having a ball, best you could. Till all of a sudden somebody hollered halt and lights came on all around us. And uh, we found out later that uh, they had had word that some German paratroopers were going to come in that night and had cut the lights off everything. And uh, so fortunately they didn't fire first. <laughs> and then they uh, cut us on in and, and put us up in the uh, Yes. How old were you then? I'm still 19. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, no, no, I was 20. Mm -hmm. 20 then. What year was this in the war? Do you remember what year? Uh, 44. 44. And uh, 
So we were there at the Bove airfield. And uh, our plane came in. This other crew brought it from England. And so, uh, but they wouldn't let, it was a new plane and a new crew. And they had a habit uh, or custom or whatever of um, taking an old crew that been a lot of missions and putting them in a new plane to check it out and flying a mission or two to see it, get all the bugs out. Because we were inexperienced, you know. And uh, so they flew one mission, it got shot up some, and uh, we went over and looked at it. Had some holes all over in it, but uh, the second mission it flew, it was shot out. The whole crew was gone. And so from then on, I was a replacement, me and my crew, meaning we, uh, we didn't have a plane. And, <clears throat> and when some crew uh, got enough points to come home or were lost or injured or whatever, we replaced them because they kept in that group they kept 30 planes they had 30 planes they flew and we were we weren't flying all the time but we were flying some and as replacement crews and, uh, so we flew out of france then for a good long while how many missions did you serve i mean what how many missions did you do 20. That wasn't really a lot, but it was uh, it was enough, I should say. We left uh, France and moved on up to Belgium. Lived in a bombed out building up there, our field. I uh, don't know where that messes up your sound or not, but the vacuum cleaners and all. But at any rate, uh, we were in a medium plane. I've got a friend who lives in Garner, lived in Beasley, who flew in 17s out of England. He comes over to see me once in a while. But we couldn't do that. The plane wouldn't, didn't have that range. Yeah. So we had to move up as the troops moved up behind them. Captured France and we're moving towards uh, the front was moving in towards... Uh, the, they'd they'd got to France and they were moving yeah. into... In the really in the Holland, in really. Holland. Okay. And uh, yeah. so finally, uh, while well, we moved into Belgium, as they moved up, yeah. as the front lines moved up, and uh, we were in Belgium for quite a while, it seemed like. And then they took the whole group, my group, and moved us up into a place called Venlo Holland, mm -hmm. a big airfield there. And uh, that's where I was when the war was over. In Holland? Yeah, was, I was living in a tent out in this forest and as a matter of fact, there's a path and you walk the path and, and you come to the German Holland border, mm -hmm. right right down the end of that path. Mm -hmm. And uh, but, uh, that's, that's where we were when the war was, uh, when it was over. Now, A lot of things took place, of course, in all between moving. Um, were your missions that flying into Germany and uh, bombing runs in? in the all of them were into yeah. Germany. Well, we had we flew some uh, some missions carried anti personnel bombs, some uh, hundred pound uh, that would uh, throw a lot of stuff out. Shrapnel and uh, mostly personnel, any personnel. Mm -hmm. We dug into foxholes and right. things like oh, gun emplacements and things. But mostly uh, we didn't do that too much. Mostly we went after bridges. As a matter of fact, they, they wrote a book on my outfit. It's called Bridge Busters. Got it upstairs in. And, uh, but and we went after rail yards, bridges, rail yards, and the factories. Mm -hmm. If we run across the factory, we had a lot of rail yards and bridges. 
which was important. You had to keep them from moving up or back either way. And uh, sometimes we'd fly, we started off flying low, um, real low. Um, dropping some a few small bombs. Mm -hmm. But we lost so many planes. They've put out a directive that uh, they want us flying anywhere from 13 to 15,000 feet mm -hmm. from then on. Uh, and they were, the Germans had this 88 that it was a deadly gun. And you put it on the tank, set it, any, mount it anywhere. And uh, probably the best gun that was ever put out. But, uh, it's called an 88? It was an 88. They couldn't get that range up to 13,000 feet? Well, they, they got the range and knocked down a lot of planes. Yeah. It just was much harder. Yeah. Right. Because every, every uh, say that every 15 seconds, say, you took evasive action, you fly level, and all of a sudden you peel off one way or the other. Right. And then fly 15 more seconds, peel off again, and uh, by the time they got the range, yeah. and it took a few seconds for that shell to get up there <laughs> at 15,000 feet. Say, so. I mean, I say a few seconds, uh, maybe three or four seconds, but uh, <coughs> but at any rate, uh, there were a lot of lot more misses than there were hits. Mm -hmm. But once in a while, one of them would hit a a plane head on and it destroys. Was that was most of the threat from the ground or did you have air missiles? We never missiles? did, my group never did have too much air mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, I don't recall one time that, um, and I don't know just what it was, back maybe a mile, I fired uh, two 50 caliber machine guns mounted. I was in the top turret sticking out of the plane. Um, and they'd breach a long ways. Yeah, that's a good weapon. And I, one time there's some plane cutting across and, and all of a sudden turned toward our, right, right into us. And I, I fired a burst across his nose way out there and he peeled off and I never saw him again. So I don't know if he's the enemy or what. But one of our boys got careless. But um, we never did. Uh, early in the war, they had a lot of uh, fire. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I got there, I didn't want too much. And our boys had cleaned up the German Air Force pretty much, the fighter plane. Mm -hmm. But um, flight was something else. You can't dig a hole and crawl in it. You, you're just there, and you could hear flak hitting the uh, side of the plane, a lot of it, little pieces and stuff. And then I, and uh, we lost a lot of planes. I'd, I'd say I'd, one one mission of 30 planes, we lost maybe 12, 13. Wow. And mine was one of them, but we uh, we managed to get down. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you crash landed and then no, we didn't crash. Well, the pilot landed. Mm -hmm. uh, I, well, I'll tell you that's the where it's as on way on up into the mission. But we went on this. It's a long mission up. I guess toward Denmark, somewhere up in there. It's a twins any house in the valley between two mountain chains and. Uh, we never did get the target. I kept seeing this big water tank down there. You can see pretty good from that distance. And I called the pilot up and asked him about it. He said, well, we can't get in. It's flax so thick. He tried it. And so he finally just dropped the bombs on what looked like a sawmill or something on the side. And we left. And, but we were shot up pretty bad. And uh, I don't know what it was, hydraulic or what, but um, we couldn't keep up with the planes that were left. And uh, evidently the pilot talked to them. Uh, 
and uh, they wagged their wings and, and they went on and sort of left us behind and we were gradually losing some altitude slowly and he was doing the best he could and we got back close to uh, what they call a bomb line that's the line between the armies you know and uh, the uh, navigator and I, I I had map reading too and we got us out some maps and kept looking and see if we could find a place to land <clears throat> Uh, well, first though, the pilot said something, we were going to bail out. And I had my chute on. I didn't wear it in the plane. I, I didn't have room with my guns. And uh, but I put my chute on and was standing at the door. He'd opened the Bombay doors. I was getting ready to jump. And they were going to follow me. And uh, so he says, wait a minute. He says, I wonder if we can find a place to land. He says, I believe I can land it. And so uh, that's me and the navigator got the maps out and started looking. And, and uh, we found a place a couple hundred miles, maybe over to the right there. And he said, we'll try it. It looked like a, like a county airport type, a small civilian airport on the map. But it had a long runway and it took a long one for us because we landed in anywhere from 135 to 150 miles an hour, and sometimes 185. Yeah, I read about that with the, uh, the way the wind was made on that B-26, you had to keep your airspeed up and land it. It stalled on if you didn't, and that's fast. Uh, we lost more planes landing than taking off, probably than any other way. But at any rate, we uh, he headed out and he found it, but in the meantime, the nose wheel, he let the wheels down, but the nose wheel was just flopping. And uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, we didn't know what to do. He was gonna come in anyhow. And uh, we could put everything in the back, weight it down where it land like that, you know, but, but instead the engineer said, maybe I can fix it. So we tied him to parachute harnesses and uh, stuff that would hold and let him down <laughs> through a place in the floor under the plane. And he did, he fixed it, but he stuck a screwdriver. It was a pin or something been shot away that stuck into a hole that caused everything else to work. And the pin had been shot away, and so uh, just flopping out. And he, he got a screwdriver, stuck a screwdriver in there. He said, I believe it'll hold. So, but the pilot landed, did a great job. He landed. And uh, so we got down pretty good. Found out the Germans were only about three or four miles down the road. But, but we had soldiers there in some tents. And well, I stayed with a, a group that had dug into the side of a little hill there, just dug a dugout back up in there. And uh, I spent the night with them. Well, we stayed there, really stayed there about six or seven days. Uh, the pilot, of course, I was unbeknownst to me at the time, but uh, the, anyhow, the pilot uh, <coughs> called up our headquarters, told them what happened. And uh, they sent uh, uh, a crew, mechanic crew, worked on our plane um, with another plane landed there and they fixed it up and uh, then they took off and left they didn't offer to carry us they just took off and left in that other plane and uh, but uh, we uh, we flew back then to the base managed to do it I uh, the war had our boards had just cleaned it out. They were, when we, before we landed, we could see that they were going in minefields with the mine detectors all over the place. And they were trying to clear out. And, uh, and they were clearing it out. And uh, another plane came in behind us, uh, what they call a Black Widow. It was a, um, 
B-26. A new B-26 painted solid black. I've got a picture of one somewhere. Um, and uh, he was with a night outfit. They did night fighting and everything. But, uh, and uh, I picked up two guns, two rifles. I, I brought those back and somebody borrowed one and dropped it overboard in the boat. Just shooting sharks and dropped it overboard. But my son-in-law now has got the other one, just a miser. And I picked up two or three bayonets. And uh, me and the bombardier got us some, motorcy some, some motorcycles there. We got one <laughs> lying around, and they were in. And we put them in the Bombay doors, in the Bombay, the plane. And uh, so then we flew back to our field a few days later. And we got the motorcycles out and ran them around the airfield there a little bit after we got calmed down some. And uh, some officers came out there and one of them said, you, can, you can't have those. <laughs> and he took them and I don't know what happened. <laughs> I never saw them again. <laughs> so we had motorcycle for a day, so. But, uh, what other questions do you guys have to? That was just, that was one incident. Yeah. That's it, took, it took place that the plane was really riddled with shells, but the damage had come through some of the uh, hydraulics or something. I don't, I don't really know. I didn't have anything to do with that, with that part of it. I was uh, in a top turret. If you know what a top turret, I can show you a picture of it. Um, had two, two machine guns mounted. My plane had lead machine guns on it. Two of them on each side were mounted that the pilot fired. There was one in the nose that the bombardier fired if he needed it. I had two at the top turret. There was a radio man had two in the tail mounted together. And the engineer, there was two waste windows. He had one out each waste window. My job was to see that they all worked. Uh, only one time did the, one, one of them jammed up and he called me and I went up and fixed it for him, and I, which I could, happen to, and uh, got back my turret. The turret was fairly small. And, uh, I fitted in it pretty full. I, I couldn't wear a chute. I had a chest chute, and I left it laying in the floor right there, and I rigged me up a, a strap under the seat, and I could pull that strap, the seat dropped off, and I could I could be out of there, and I had to practice it, but I could be out of there in 11 seconds, which is not, not too bad, really. Mm -hmm. The waste window was pretty close. But we had to do that practice in case we had to ditch in water or something. But I never wore to shoot in the plane. Just couldn't, a chest shoots in your way, right. you know. But uh, that was one incident. Uh, what were your most memorable experiences? My most memorable experience was when they nearly dropped me out of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were on a bombing mission. And uh, like I said, we had a, what they call a bomb run, uh, bomb line. Uh, anything up to that, mostly our boards on the ground, but you were protected. No, no guns or nothing. Anything beyond that, you could look out, you didn't know. But my job, I had two jobs. One was a gunner, I fired guns. And uh, sometimes when we flew low, I fired them at trains or whatever I saw that was moving, I reckon. And, uh, but also bombs, like I said. And uh, it was up to me to, once we got in the air, uh, it was up to me to arm them. I crawled up in there, in the bomb bays, 
in a pretty tight place. And uh, some of the bombs had a little wheel on the nose. And uh, you had to stay, a wire was stuck through but in a car key of some kind. And, and uh, if I, yeah, I had to go up and pull those car keys out before that wire would come out. When the bomb dropped, the wire was hung and it stayed in the plane. Then when the bomb left the plane, the little wheel, you know, made so many revolutions and flew off. Well, that bomb would go off then, first thing it hit. And uh, so it was up to me to get, get those cotter keys or see that the wires were in the slot there and everything. And uh, I went up this one time, uh, and by the way, we had a an extra uh, bombardier alone. Now the reason for that, I don't know. Uh, that was their business, but <clears throat> most of the reason for two bombardiers in a plane is one was uh, real new, new to the outfit, and uh, the old one was sort of to train him, uh, let him know what to do and all. And they every time a new one come up, they they did this. We we weren't new, so I, I can only assume that he was. Uh, Mine had to go up one time early on and do the same thing. But uh, I was up there arming the bombs, and we had 100 pound bombs yeah. uh, on this load. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, I heard a swoosh, and a, it happened out on this plane. Most of it came out together, but on the plane we were on, one of them came out real quick, and the other moved slow. And I was the only one that moved slow. <laughs> Doors. When they opened, everything was under, open underneath. You could look down and look at the ground. And uh, I don't know why that new bombardier had taken it into his head to check the Bombay doors and see if they worked good. Wow. And I was standing on it. And I saw the one come up and the other start, start moving. And so I grabbed hold of the the 100 pound bomb there, and, and I was just hanging on the 100 pound bomb. And they had a little door up there, and they opened the door and looked out and saw me, and they, needless to say, they closed the bomb bay door as soon as they could. <laughs> you didn't have a parachute on it. Oh, no, couldn't get up there with it. And, um, You're looking at France below. Uh, you, all you saw was green fields and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure it won't long, but it seemed like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was, if I'd have been on the other door, and there were bombs on the other side, <coughs> on a, uh, it was a rack, and the place you walked was about this wide, it's all. But then the frames went up like this, so the bombs would drop, wouldn't hit the plane. And um, if I'd have gone down, or if the bomb had to have uh, come loose, I would have ridden it down. That's the only thing I know. I'd probably held on to it till it hit, and that would have been it. And, uh, well, they apologized, but need he was an officer. But needless to say, uh, I had a few choice things to say to him. <laughs> I had to, you know, the odd part about it, it didn't bother me a bit while I was up there. It was only after the mission was over and I got back down on the ground and got right weak to legs and sat down. It, it's odd, just like I would have. But I think it's so much I had to look after. And, uh, but he didn't say anything. I, I, I kind of chewed him out a little bit and used a few choice words. But he knew what he'd done, he knew he'd done wrong. He should have checked first and all that kind of stuff. But that was the most rememberable, you know, as far as danger is concerned. Uh, you were in danger every time you went up.
uh, any time there was flak. I don't remember but one mission that we call the milk run, and that's where there was nothing. We didn't have any opposition, no guns firing outside. I don't know where it was and what it was. It wasn't up to me to know. I was just to look after guns and bombs. But uh, the bombardier had been briefed and he knew where it was going and everything about it. But you were in such a habit of, you just went, you know, you didn't ask him every time where we're going, all this kind of stuff. But uh, there's only one mission I can remember that, and it was so obvious that it was remembered kind of as nothing happened at all. <coughs> all the planes, of course, came back safe and sound. Uh, I said I was a replacement. When we got to the, they put us in a tent when we first got to uh, Stone, uh, Beauvais, Stone, not Stone, uh, Beauvais, France. Um, put us in a tent. There was a tent with four people and there were three in there. And there was one vacant bunk. And uh, they said, that's yours. And it had a sleeping bag, had everything, you know. And uh, I questioned it sort of, and they said, well, and they called his name. Young fella, he'd been killed three days earlier. And so uh, I, I used his bunk and I would replace him. And uh, used his new sleeping bag. And he, Nobody claimed it, nobody wanted it, and it came in real good. It was cold. It was cold there like it is here, and wet. And uh, that is the wintertime. So it was a replacement, and then you just flew whenever they had a replacement, somebody for you. Did you get anything else? I... How did you entertain yourself when you're not flying or anything? Sleeping, reading, if you, if you can find something to read. Uh, you know, I look back and t I couldn't, I couldn't tell you exactly. I don't, time went by, but uh, there was nothing outstanding. Sometimes you'd, somebody would have a little checkerboard and play some checkers, uh, stuff you really didn't care about, but it's something to do. But a lot of times you'd just sit around talking smoking and talking and and uh, if I got something to read I uh, I read it and uh, somebody handed me a book one time and says here you can enjoy this and I got back to my tent and it was everything in every word in German <laughs> <laughs> I brought it home with me I finally gave it to somebody I don't know I couldn't read a word in it by the way, uh, there were six of us in the crew. One, one was uh, little Bob Cummings, he's a little Irishman. Four of them were Germans. We were, and uh, I mean, we all some kind of descent from far enough back. But this was like one generation on. Two of them, uh, the bombardier, uh, his uh, grandparents still lived over there. As a matter of fact, we bombed the town his grandparents lived in. There was a big rail yard there. Wow. But we hit the rail yard, and uh, I mean, we, we did a good job on it. And I'm sure his grandparents, uh, his grandparents were all right already. His name was, was uh, Oscar Stricker, but he was German. And uh, he didn't have any qualms about dropping bombs on Germany. Um, one was uh, John Steingraber, and his parents uh, spoke very little English. They, they had come over here. John was an American over here. I don't know where he was born in Germany or what, but he was a full American. He was the engineer. And uh, my pilot was H.K. Carter, and uh, I met his mother. I know she drank Kimmel, which is a German drink, but uh, he had par he had uh, uncles or something over there. 
John Steingrave had an uncle who was in the uh, German ski out to outfit in Russia and had mailed him some stuff from over there, John, and mailed him a, a ski troop outfit. I've got a picture, so I, I've got a couple, I think somebody had asked me to get some pictures up about something. There's some school here in Raleigh, really. And I fumbled around and found a few, and I've got, I put his coat on, white coat and hat, and he took the picture out of it. I didn't go to the trouble putting those white pants on it. <laughs> but uh, the co-pilot's name was J.H. Carter, and they wanted any kin. <laughs> he, he was from uh, Louisiana, and uh, H.K. was from Pennsylvania, somewhere up there. <clears throat> and John was from up that way, too. Bob Cummings was from Washington, D.C. But I thought it odd, and as soon as the war was over, um, they uh, <clears throat> sent me, uh, let's see, from Venlo, Holland, well, the crew, uh, whole crew, up to uh, up to Germany in a truck, uh, up to Cologne. We had bombed Cologne, which I have some pictures of. And uh, uh, from there, they put us in different place to sleep. We had a coal, old coal yard, what was left to Cologne. That's where we had to sleep with some buildings in the coal yard. I went over to see them about the, next, the night we were there, or the next night, some of them, and we talked to everything, and the next morning they came and told me that I was leaving in like an hour on the plane to get my stuff together and get out to the airfield. And I did, and they flew me to a place called Namur, Belgium, Air Force Headquarters, an attachment to Air Force Headquarters. Uh, somebody told me later that uh, they took all four of uh, them, I don't know what happened to come, he's the Irishman, but they took four of them and sent them home here because they didn't want them uh, afraid they might tour around and hunting up some, some of the people. Uh, and the war being just over, it was dangerous. <coughs> Very dangerous. And uh, I mean, there were a lot of people that didn't agree with, on their side, that didn't agree with the war being over. But uh, uh, that was, a, I was at Air Force headquarters. Uh, I don't know, for maybe a month. And then, uh, they sent me to a, took a, a train to a place called Castle. Well, we stopped off for two or three days at a place called um, uh, Kitzinger or something like that. And Bad Kitzinger, I believe it was. And uh, stayed there some uh, big buildings that the SS troops trained and stayed there three or four days and then and then we uh, went on up to a place called Castle which we uh, I was there during Christmas and uh, from Castle we flew down to France to take a boat. I took a boat a boat back over. Uh, Maribo B. Lamar, we was trying to think of the name of that place. <laughs> it was a little, one of those little Liberty ships. And it, uh, we hit storms all the way. It took 21 days to come to New York. And part of the time, and they posted the, uh, uh, on the, as the bulletin board, they posted the speed and everything that was going on during the day. And I pulled it off each time and kept it. I, I, what happened to them now? I guess some of my girls have got boxes of stuff, you know. And, and uh, but it showed that we were going backward uh, one day, and the <laughs> storm was so bad. And uh, I was at the very bow of the ship, with uh, three decks of bunk, and a uh, bad place to be because the head was right up in front of me, and uh, everybody got sick. 
But at any rate, the boat sprung a leak. And then we didn't realize it till they started bringing some wheelbars full of cement. Regular cement looked like <laughs> up there dumping it. Where there's a little little, little leak, you know. <clears throat> but uh, that was interesting, sort of. Um, See, I don't. Oh, I, I, one, if you want to call it adventure, uh, the war was just over, and I volunteered for. They needed a, some guards for a train that was going up through in Germany. That's where it went to bad Kissinger. I, my first thought was in Kitzinger. I was right, and uh, carrying some. They had we had troop there. And they were carrying a lot of food and ammunition and whatever. I don't really know. And uh, up there in boxcars. And the three, six of us volunteered. The three uh, lieutenants and three sergeants. Although the rank had nothing to do with it. They did, they were over me. Nobody told me what to do. I was my own man. <clears throat> Just like everybody else. And I had a certain portion of plan, uh, trains to guard. And we went up through the mountains, and uh, so steep that if I wanted to bum a cigarette or something, I could hop off and run up ahead to the carpet and <laughs> bar something. That's how slow we were going at times. But anyhow, we, uh, we got through it, it stayed at night a lot of times on top of the boxcar. Because, like I said, the war was just over. And uh, so we got in there, and uh, <clears throat> I was pulling, uh, stayed on the train, uh, slept there and everything. And uh, several of us, three or four of us, were walking around the train. And uh, there's another set of boxcars on another track there. And we heard some talking going on in one of them. And so we opened the door, and there were a bunch of gypsies in there. It's odd. They were real gypsies. And what they were doing is they were up there, and they were trying to get home, go the other way, as soon as they hooked up those cars. And uh, so we got on there. Two of us got on there, and then we called a, uh officer of the guard, and some lieutenant, he came down, and... Um, Looked it over and said everything seemed to be all right. He won't want to do anything, nothing to do really. And uh, one of the girls spoke English, and she said that uh, her father and some other men had gone into town there to try to find some food and everything. And so we uh, just got off, closed the door, and left them alone. Uh, about three days later, we, <clears throat> a train started back the other way, back to where we were. And uh, this was a more or less empty train. We guarded a full one up. And when I say a train, it's maybe like six boxcars, uh, maybe five, six. Uh, very small, big, long trains. And uh, I was standing in one of the boxcars. And every time we uh, come to a crossroad or anything, we'd stop, and uh, you'd all kinds of people trying to get on on the train, and but we had orders not to let anybody on at all. And uh, of course, when we were armed. I had a uh, rifle and a, a shoulder, a pistol with a shoulder holster. I wore that all during the on every mission, the pistol in uh, 45. And we got to one uh, little crossroad place there and the train stopped. And there were <clears throat> four girls and one of them had a bicycle she had found. And uh, some character yanked the bicycle, got on it, took off. And I, I felt sorry for the girl, you know, and little, little girl. And uh, so I uh, that's up to the girls about it. And one of those spoke English. And they were from, she said they were from Estonia. 
I didn't know exactly where that was, but she said they were from Estonia. And they were uh, some kind of religion. Uh, I've forgotten exactly what it was. Uh, they got them done, they got a church out there. Hmm. Eastern Orthodox? No. Uh, what are those that go around the houses and uh, Mormon? Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They said they were Jehovah's Witnesses. <coughs> and uh, I thought that, you know, it spread around, all right. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, they were going the way we were going. So I told them to get on that boxcar. It was empty you know, uh, with me. And uh, and they did. You know, I mean, I. I didn't care about the rules at that time. I didn't care. And a lot of other people tried, and I wouldn't let them on. But uh, then the train took off, and uh, we went for a long ways, uh, several miles. And then uh, they were going, they knew where they were going, and so they were going one way, and the train was going another, and, and they got off. And uh, of course, never saw them again, but they were very appreciative because they would have had to go on through those mountains and that would have been a tough. I mentioned the war just being over. Um, there was a, a soldier, German soldier, and he had a crutch that he had made limping very badly. And he was going the way we were going. And I told him, I said, you get on here and you can ride. And, uh, and he had a bottle of wine. That's all he had. And so he got on there and I asked him what happened. And I looked at his leg, he had a man whose head leg looked bad, it had been shot. He said a black man, a soldier, he was crossing the field and he shot him, one of our American soldiers. But like I said, the war hadn't been over about three days or so. And I don't know, maybe some of them didn't even realize the war was over. It was still dangerous out there. So we carried him, I carried him a good little ways, and we drank his wine, and I was glad to get some too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't, you didn't touch the water. It was pretty, they'd get water out of streams, and you didn't know what was upstream. And it was pretty, pretty bad, I think. So uh, you, you drank beer, you drank wine, the wine was, a little bit different than you. I think it was a lot, seemed like that was milder. You use it with a meal very easily. Uh, and then uh, the train got on back to the moor, and uh, I was assigned to a, uh, a colonel. <clears throat> I can't remember his name, Kelsey, I believe, but uh, he said he didn't have anything for me to do, but there's a little room right next to his office. He said, you can go, go in there and have you make you an office. So I did, went in there and made an office and, and uh, had a telephone and uh, got a little desk and everything, a nice little office. And, uh, and did nothing. I had nothing to do. But me and the current, we became pretty good friends, kind of. And, uh, so um, one day he said, I says, I told him, I said, I don't have anything to do. So he gave me, a, he had me calling up uh, uh, Air Force headquarters in different countries if he had some something to send out. He started letting me do that. And, uh, and that was all I was doing. I'd talk to England, I talked to with a number, a particular number to call and give him the message and that was it. And he said, go out and get your secretary. And uh, I'm not tell the boys that, but uh, I toured the bars in the moor, <laughs> found the prettiest girl I could find and hired her. <laughs> and uh, as secretary. <clears throat> and she didn't type and take dictation or nothing else. I said, you don't have to. <laughs> she spoke English a little bit. That was good enough. So uh, I brought her back and she had a job as my secretary doing nothing. <laughs> and that's what we did the rest of the time I was there. And 
the colonel went on a, um, went to Switzerland on a leave. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, when he got back, like I said, we became friends kind of thing. Uh, he would call me in and we'd talk about Paris. I'd, I've been in Paris for three days. Uh, didn't mention that, but they sent us to Paris before we even flew our first mission for three days. Uh, I found out that the, in case you got shot out, at least you'd had some fun, mm -hmm. you know, or walking around, or whatever. But we were talking about different things. When I actually got back, I I uh, went in there and said something about asking him how his trip was and all this, that, and the other. And I says, you gallivanting around? And I says, you you won't let me do a thing. I'll sit here doing nothing. He says, take off and go to Switzerland. So he fixed it up, my dad. Got with a, a four or five is a fellow I was staying with at that time named Springer. It was two men, Springer, who played in a, a cornet in, um, I've forgotten them. I'm getting old now. <laughs> I've forgotten. And uh, oh, Charlie Spivak's orchestra. Have you ever heard of him? Mm -hmm. hadn't, a lot of people hadn't heard of him, but he, he was pretty famous at one time. And, uh, and Fred uh, Hurst, Gersh, Fred Gersh. His dad had a ranch in California, Gridley, California. And he, uh, hired out horses to the movies. You can see a pack of horses, a lot of horses run. His father owned a lot of those. And they had a, when they made the picture Robin Hood with Earl Flynn, you probably remember that. His, his father uh, rented out the horses to him and, and they put Fred in the, uh, in the movie, jumping out of one of the trees one time and, and he jumped out and broke his leg and that was his movie. Debut. <laughs> he did break a leg. <laughs> he did break his leg. He broke it. And uh, so we enjoyed it. He was my roommate there at uh, the Moor. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, nothing else. We stayed in an old hospital. Had been in the hospital in the Moor, Air Force headquarters. Uh, by the way, the colonel had a he confiscated this big. It was a Duesenberg car, mm -hmm. a huge thing, you know. It cost a hundred thousand dollars if you could find one now. And he had a girlfriend from the uh, Red Cross up on the hill there in a, a little chateau. And uh, he drove up to there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, he drove up one time and he, I don't know what happened, left the brakes off or something, and the car rolled down the hill and went in a fish pond, a little fish pond. So the next day he says, uh, do you want a car? I said, yeah, I'm about to have a car, walking around. He says, I, you'd have that car of mine. And he says, by the way, it's, it's in a fish pool. <laughs> so uh, I called up the motor pool I said, this is Colonel Chelsea. My car just went in the fish pool and I want it out and fixed up. <laughs> <laughs> and they thought I was the Colonel. And uh, I want you to know about four or five days later, maybe a week, they had it fixed up, driving around. <laughs> so, uh, so there I was, driving this big limousine type car. I did that for a whole day. And the colonel says, I want my car back. <laughs> <laughs> and what you gonna do? <laughs> Tell him he couldn't have it. <laughs> he could have sent me to <laughs> Japan or somewhere. <laughs> but uh, so well that's a you run into these they're short sometimes, but the experiences. The real experiences. And uh I know uh, one other, the only other thing that happened to me was um, in the moor. It was a club. 
and it seemed like all the service being rent there. <clears throat> Had a little band even. How do you spell the more? N A M N U R. N A M U R, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. The more. And uh, so I went to this club and <coughs> uh, about every night. And uh, all the rest of us did too. And drinking beer or something, you know. And uh, I walked into. Hello, I'm sorry. I like that. That's on the. Um, and so, uh, but I went one night, a couple of us, and uh, I don't know what it was, but I got sick. Well, uh, before then, I noticed these two girls came in, real pretty girls, and they were sitting, uh, they came in early, sat at a booth, and nobody was, they were never with anybody. And uh, of course, all the soldiers, you know how they wanted to go over and talk, but it had nothing to do with anybody. And it finally got to be known all right, so they were alone. I got sick this one night, and I had to pass their booth, and I'd taken off to the restroom. I had to throw up, and I did. And I reckon I looked sick. But uh, when I came back by the booth, uh, one of them said, you want to sit down here for a while? And I did, I sat down. I didn't have much to say, because I didn't feel good at all. Uh, the next night that I was there, they were there. And so I, I, walked, I just walked over and asked them, could I sit down? Yeah. And so uh, we became quite friendly for a few nights there. But um, I was leaving uh, in a couple of days, uh, the last night I was there. And they walked out and I walked out with them. And somebody told me later that the the blonde, the, the tall blonde was a, uh, a Belgian movie star or some kind. But see, I never, she was pretty enough, but I never backed that up anything. So uh, I don't know if that's called that an experience or not, but it's just one of those things that happened to you once in a while. <laughs> and then go anywhere, won't meant to, but. That'd be an interesting experience overall, being from Coach, North Carolina, and being yeah. a young man and spending that, all that time in, in all those places in Europe. You'd be surprised what you run across. I end up a place called Mosaic, Belgium. I had, I got a girlfriend, and my, me and the pilot went. He he was a camera buff, and we, he and I ran the ground together. And uh, he was a lieutenant. I was a buck sergeant. That's three stripes. That's all I was. But uh, and I've never. I think in all the times I've known my crew. Three of them officers, I never said, sir, or yes, sir, or no, sir, or nothing. I called them all by the first name. I called him HK. But he and I went down through uh, Holland, all the way down into Belgium, and he was looking cameras. And he found some. Uh, but I, we went to this one place, and I met this girl. Her mother and daddy ran a, uh, well, it was a barber that lived upstairs, so drinks downstairs, and um, it wasn't all that far. And I, I hit a ride on a truck. Sometimes come, I came back down there several times. She was uh, like May Queen. It, it was some. I, I've got a lot of one of my girls has got a lot of pictures of the, the ceremony that took place. She was up on a throne and all that kind of stuff. So, but. Uh, at any rate, in Mosaic, it's a Mosaic Bell, right on the border of Holland. There's a little bridge separated. I ran across a, a man who was a dentist and got to talking to him. And he uh, he did his training over here. He, he got to be a dentist in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, he went to Emory University. And uh, his daughter came out, and I met her, and, and uh, he spoke English as good as I do. He was Belgian, and he'd gone back, and that's where he practiced his work. So that you, you never know who you're going to run across. Hmm. And he, 
I thought that was kind of odd. My father was a dentist. He went to Emory. It's the reason that interested me. Mm -hmm. I was a little surprised. But you're right. Uh, in totality, these things all make up an interesting thing. One thing by itself. It's just, you know, something that happens. I, we've all got things that's happened to us in our life that uh, you could call it exciting, I guess, or remembering. You guys got any other specific questions over there you want to ask as part of your project? I've taken up your time talking. Didn't mean to. Yeah, I think you covered them all. Yeah. Do you have any advice for these boys who might consider a military career? Well, not really. I <clears throat> found out you give advice and sometimes it's wrong. But uh, even though there's a war going on, I, I think it, it made a man out of me. Like I said, I was... I had a college young. Of course, the reason for that was they only had lead grades then, so you know, that was part of it. And uh, I don't know, when you you might not want to, but when you're young, your decisions are not always great because you don't have any experience to fall back on. But um, the Army or Navy or whatever, it's rigid to a certain degree. You're your own man, but but you, you've got to uh, uphold certain standards. And and uh, if there's something going on that a lot of people uh, expect him to back them up, and and you do it. I mean, my crew, for example, uh, would lay their life down in my hands. They knew I would do something, and I, I would do. My pilot, I didn't question him. I, I took for granted he's going to look after me. It's just, uh, you're like brothers, kind of. And I think overall it it just made me more of a man than uh, maybe I would have been. Uh, who knows? But uh, I don't regret the time in. I mean, at that time I'd like to have gotten out, but, but uh, I can't say that it's bad. And, and not only that, you know, you, there are certain advantages. You, uh, they pay for schooling, you know, a certain amount of schooling. I used that for two years. The GI Bill, they called it. And uh, came in real handy because college is expensive to you know something. And, uh, and the Army will send you to a whole lot of different schools if you want to be a radio man, they'll send you to a radio school. Um, you can, just about any, if you were a woman, they'd send you to nursing and stuff like that. So uh, there are a lot of advantages in, uh, in being, well, the, I guess you'd say the disadvantages uh, in this day and time, you don't know where you're gonna wind up, but. But really, it might be good because after being what we in in Afghanistan and different places, uh, once that's over, uh, I don't think we'd be too quick to enter anything else. And so it might be a good time to think about getting in because I think uh, uh, I don't think you'd have to worry about another war right quick, and you probably fulfill any duties you might have way before anything like that took place. Uh, one thing is you'd be sent to different places now. I guess if you went some places and didn't like it, you could ask to transfer, but I mean, they send people to England, Germany, France, Holland, Belgium, um, and uh, uh, Japan, and, and all these places, and uh, uh, you do my tour of the world. You'd be surprised what an education that is in itself. You meet so many different people and so many customs and, 
and all that uh, you find out we're not the only ones around, you know. Other people are on this planet and they've got as much right to be on it as we do and they have their customs, it's not up to me to, uh, I might not like them, but it's not up to me to try to interfere with them, you know. Uh, I can gripe to myself, I reckon, about it, but but it has its advantages too. And then you, you, you meet a lot of good friends. I hadn't been in contact with my crew since I got out. Uh, my pilot came, I was in way after the war was over in Winston-Salem and I got home to Coates and my, had an aunt there that said that the H.K. Carter, pilot, my pilot came, had come by to see me. And, and I wasn't there and I don't know where he went. I never have been in touch with him since. That was, oh, 20 years ago. But um, you do meet, you meet a lot of, a lot of good friends and somebody you may want to keep in contact with. Uh, uh, there are one or two people here that uh, uh, keep in contact. Christmas cards, if nothing else. I mean, you just, uh, and I did, used to, would fall down in, the, down in Florida. You used to get cards and everything. I didn't get one this Christmas, so something could have happened to him. He's my age, but um, it has its advantages, I guess you'd say. But uh, so does life. Yeah. If you stay done, you know, wherever, you're gonna find times that not too pleasant. You're going to have some good times, and, uh, but then you're not, you're going to be limited to what you can talk about too. So I guess the Army, I wouldn't hesitate my, if I had a son going in, uh, I'd, I'd agree to it. Yeah. I've got a friend here who could have met with us, but as a matter of fact, he and I interviewed once or twice together here. There have been some other schools that have been by and uh, sent, sent us a DVD player uh, disc of, of the interview. And he's interviewed, he was uh, on an aircraft carrier in the Pacific. He was on the Ranger. And uh, they haul planes a lot of times over. P-40s, I know, they carried up toward China up in there. And uh, he had a lot of experiences, stuff like that. There's uh, another fellow good, that's a friend of mine, Hank. He, he flew uh, B-24s. And there's another fellow that just came in a couple of months ago, and he was a P-47 pilot. Huh. So. Uh, We've got several of them around, and they all got experiences, and and uh, they're here, and uh, they enjoyed their time. As a matter of fact, if you want to buy a plane, there's a fellow here who's got one for there. <laughs> he's well, he's ninety something. He's not flying anymore. Isn't he? What kind of plane? It's a Cherokee 180. Mm -hmm. Seats four people. Mm -hmm. It's up in Lynchburg, and he uh, said he'd take forty thousand dollars for it. Mm -hmm. And it's a good, that's good flying shape. And and uh, tell me that Cherokee was a good plane. He's had, he's, we had one fella here, a fella named Bill Cox. Uh, he got a girlfriend, he owned a house here in Raleigh. And he moved out of here and went to his house in Raleigh. <laughs> but uh, he used to own some planes. And he flew uh, cargo planes out of uh, different places, uh, Wichita, Kansas, Boeing, aircraft factory up there in different places. He did a lot of flying. Yeah. And they've all got experiences. I used to sit and listen to Bill talk about his his flying time. And it's, it's amazing. But uh, being in service can do that. You can, once you're out of it, you're glad you're in it. Thank you, Mr. Fuqua. Listen, there's no problem. I've done the most talking I've done in six months. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, any final 
comments or words you want to say before we turn the camera on? No, I don't know if I have any. I don't really. I sort of relish what I've had. By the way, I, 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 I get the, getting up is a problem. Did Joe tell you what happened? No. Joe and I went to Washington, D.C. Uh-oh. What's on? Did he tell you he tell you went to Washington? No. <clears throat> well, Joe and I went to Washington, D.C. with uh, a fellow here who died three months ago, Dan Hatch. And uh, Carson Greg, uh, Carson Dannon. Mm -hmm. You know Carson? Mm -hmm. And uh, Carson got a, a big motor home from somewhere. His son drove it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you know his son. I know his son very well. Yeah. Uh, he was probably in some business with you. So. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, his son drove it. And and uh, and another fellow they call a preacher, and I can't remember his name. <clears throat> he flew P-40s out of under Chinook, probably in China. And uh, Carsey was in Patton's tank corps. Mm -hmm. Old Levin Beasley went. Levin flew 17s out of England. And me and Joe. Joe's all, always been interested in planes ever, ever since I've known him. And uh, I had a very enjoyable trip. But on the way back, that motorhome, we were going fairly slow and uh, he ran up with some traffic or something. I stood up to go wash my hands or go to the bathroom or something. And by that time, he, he missed the traffic and mashed the gas and the bus took off. And I went right on through the air and hit a cabinet. And that's where I broke those discs in my back. Ouch. And uh, so when I came up here, I wasn't using this walking, but now I use it for uh, I get out and walk without putting any pressure down, and my back starts killing me in five minutes. Mm -hmm. But uh, with this, as long as I'm mashing down, relieving a little bit of pressure in my back, uh, it's all right now. Not all right, but I get along. And, uh, and I'll be with me the rest of my life, but then that's part of it. And I made it six. And, don't have that much time left on right, but but uh, I had an enjoyable trip. Do not tell you about it sometime. One of the reasons we went up there, though, uh, one of the planes that I flew in was called Flakbait. <laughs> Flakbait. Flak. F L A K. Mm -hmm. It started off being called the pilot and the crew who flew that plane over. He called it Flea Bait after his dog. But well, somewhere along the line, they changed it after you got a few holes in the plane. They changed it to flight bait. Well, that crew left, and they issued the plane to another crew, and that crew left the, another crew. And finally, different crews would, it was just sitting out there flying it. And I flew in it the last two missions, I believe it flew, combat missions. And it's in the uh, Smithsonian Institute now in uh, Washington, in the Aeronautical Space mm -hmm. And that's what we went up to see. I see. And yeah. uh, United States Congressman Bob Etheridge met us up there, and we were given the grand tour, and uh, the man in charge of it, oh, then they carried us out to Baltimore, somewhere out in Merle, mm -hmm. not in Baltimore, but out in the country, to some warehouses, and this is where they, they store all the stuff that goes into the Smithsonian. That's mm -hmm. in Suitland, Suitland, Maryland. I don't. Yeah. And, uh, well, you know more about it than I do. And uh, you've been out there? It's interesting. It is, very interesting. And uh, they're putting planes together. And, and then we were given a grand tour, and and uh, the guy in charge of, out there, plus the guy, the head restorer, signed a little catalog gave it to me. I know, it's upstairs somewhere. And uh, 
but uh, went mostly to, to see the monument out there in, uh, and to see that, see the plane that I flew the last two missions in, called Flak Bay. And uh, that's me there. Oh, there's that white suit I was, <laughs> that German ski troop outfit on the top part. That, that's the plane that, the body of it's up there. They hadn't put the wings on it yet, though they hadn't then. I don't remember now what I, I wrote that up for somebody. We flew, we were flying low there and you can't get much lower, about 50 feet off the ground. What a bummer, and that's low. If anything happens, you're dead. I mean, there's no way to correct it. That's just pictures of the plane. What was the altitude you were flying at before they moved you up higher when you had so many problems with the 88? What, did, what was the normal bombing altitude? Well, I don't know that it was really normal. I, I, I don't know. I really didn't keep up with it. Um, I just went along for the ride, so to speak. <laughs> but um, there, there was one time that I, I looked out the waste window and I felt like it. If I'd stick my hand out, I could reach a pine, uh, reach over a tree. That's how close. And I swore up and down I heard it scrape the bottom, but I don't reckon I did. And, uh, but uh, as far as the bombing and all is concerned, uh, I'd say we're maybe 500 feet uh, or so up there. What, what group were you in? What was your... Uh, well, when I went group? over, I was in the 322nd. That black, black what do you call it? The black... Uh, black Widow? Black, black Widow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they that took that one there and converted it in... 394. I was in the 322nd and we lost, finally lost so many planes. They transferred the rest of us that were left to the 394. That one says in 21 months, Flat Bay had more than a thousand holes shot in on its missions. Flat Bay. <laughs> we were, the, I believe, we were the only plane that went on a mission that flew a night mission. You know, we didn't fly night missions mm -hmm. except for that Black Widow group. Mm -hmm. But the bombers, uh, we just we didn't fly. We flew day missions. Mm -hmm. But we did go on a couple of night missions, and I went on one of them. A place called, uh, I call it Jitterbug, but it had some odd name, and it's it was inside of Berlin from the area. But it was a night mission. I don't remember exactly where it was. I don't even know what we were after. I never questioned that. That was up to the bombardier and navigator. Mm -hmm. Same man. Bombardier and navigator, same man. How many planes, how many wet in your 
squadron, how, how big was the squadron of planes that would go out on 30. missions? 30 of them? Usually 30. They fly in flights. Uh, you have three planes, you have a lead plane, and then one on each back, a little on each side. The lead plane was the lead bombardier, maybe. So he had a, he had a Norton bomb site, maybe. Nobody else did. You know what I'm talking about by mm -hmm. Norton bombs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then down here a little lower, three more planes with a plane here and one, two back. Six planes in that flight. Another flight over here, another flight, but th 30, usually 30 planes in all. And uh, my plane was number six position, and they called it Coffin Corner. The plane itself they called the Widowmaker. Uh, if you read about a B-26, you'll find out at first it was a, uh, they just knew about stop making them. It was so dangerous to fly in. But the thing about it is, if, if anything happened to it, you're all right as long as you're flying. But it, it was awfully difficult to correct. And it would flip over on its back. Some people, they, uh, they brought them in on one engine, a lot of them. But a lot of times it was just too fast for some, anything to happen. Every, time, every mission, after we came off of a mission, uh, they debriefed us. Uh, each one of us individually. We had a little tent we'd go to and be some guy in there writing everything down. He wanted to know everything. Of course, what they did later on was, you know, put it all together, I guess. Uh, I just told him what I'd seen. But they were, they were especially interested in uh, any time we lost any planes, which was near about all the time, losing one or two. Um, he'd want to know how it went down, what happened. Did it uh, turn over or did it fly straight in or were the engines smoking? You know, anything I could recognize. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but especially how many parachutes did I see leave? Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of planes go down and I've never seen six parachutes, so somebody didn't make it uh, in every plane. Sometimes, I think about, Three or four, four parachutes of most I ever saw come out of a plane. Because, but it could be that the people were dead in it. Uh, what I mean is the whatever hit them, the flight that hit them, could have blown them up inside. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, uh, I never th thought of asking really when I got back. It's just an everyday go happen so. Mm -hmm. But. Um, you're sad, you, 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 you meet somebody and the next day they're gone. Or uh, when you get back you see a, a ground crew, each plane had a crew, ground crew, and a crew chief. And uh, seeing them hanging around where they parked their plane, and there's no plane there, you know. And sometimes, it's odd, but sometimes a late, like us, would come in. They had gone somewhere, or maybe they, maybe they were just late getting back. They, uh, the rest of them came in, landed, and, and did it. And their plane was there, but maybe 30 minutes later, he might come in. Mm -hmm. It had trouble too, or something. So, I never did keep track. I never did know. You know, all I knew is we had some shot down. I didn't. I didn't go into questioning. You know, how many or where, where did he go down? And that wasn't up to me to, to know really. I, I never really questioned it. Unless it was a, a, a real, somebody come attached to that we kind of run, run around together uh, when we were over here or something. And uh, once in a while I'd lose one of those, I tried to find out kind of what went on, what happened. We we had one fellow named Emery. Amory. I believe it's Amory. From up New York and he went half crazy. We he won't fly and he put on a baseball suit and go out in the woods and 
Oh, he did all, all kinds of odd things. But he had been, uh, his plane had been shot down like three or four times and, and he had been blown out of it. It's the reason he was alive. The rest of them died. Wow. And, uh, and he just went off his rocker for a while. And I can kind of understand it. You guys have anything else? Nope. nope. Thank you. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Your time. Appreciate your time. Brings back memories for me. I really had nobody to talk to about it. You know, they're not interested either. Either they're not interested in it, they had their own. So. Good.